Hi, and welcome. My name is Eric McGrain. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at NMSU and a member of the organizing committee for the NMSU Climate Change Education Seminar Series, which we thank you for attending this evening. In spring 2022, a group of us as faculty taught a new honors class associated with this series in which students in the class studied climate and environmental communication and worked together to propose speakers for this year's NM Success Series. Tonight's talk featuring Robert Reed directly came out of recommendations from students in the honors class. And Adeline Triplett, who is a junior at NMSU in journalism, will introduce tonight's talk. Before I turn it over to Adeline, though, I have a few thank yous. Thank you to the NMSU Office of Strategic Initiatives for support and to the William Conroy Honors College. I'd also like to thank Irene Holgin and also the New Mexico Recycling Coalition and the South Central Solid Waste Authority for getting word out about this talk. Also, thanks goes to the office of Senator Ben Ray Lujan and especially Renee Romo. Even though we're doing this webinar virtually, NMSU is embedded within a place and a location in New Mexico. I'd like to share NMSU's land acknowledgement. NMSU honors Native American knowledges and worldviews based on intimate relationships to the natural world. The genesis of the Southwest indigenous peoples, including the Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, established their guardianship of the lands now occupied by New Mexico State University. As members of the state's land grant university, we acknowledge and respect the sovereign Indian nation and indigenous peoples. We pledge and aim to have a meaningful and respectful relationship with the sovereign Indian nations, indigenous communities, and Native American peoples within the institution. Additionally, in the context of this climate change series, and as members of the NM Success Steering Committee, we also recognize that indigenous peoples have historically and are presently often on the front lines of facing, addressing, and adapting to the consequences of climate change and resisting the causes of climate change. As members of the NM Success Steering Committee, we believe that indigenous knowledges and practices are crucial to recomposing a just, sustainable, healthy, and flourishing future for the diversity of human and more than human life on our planet. Looking forward, the next talk in this series will be by Dr. Diana Liverman, who will present a talk titled, Towards a Safe and Just Earth System, Protecting the Planet While Ensuring Justice for All. This talk will be in person at Fountain Theater in Messia. Mark your calendars for Tuesday, February 28th at 7 p.m. You'll also see a flyer shared in the chat. Okay, so back to tonight's talk and one quick housekeeping note. You can use the Q&A function to ask questions, which we will have Robert address after his presentation. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Adeline Triplett, who will introduce Robert Reed's tonight. Hi everyone, thank you all for coming today. As Eric said, my name is Adeline Triplett and I'm a junior here at NMSU. I was a student in the honors class communicating global climate change last spring, and I'm really excited to be a part of this NM success talk. During our class last semester, my peers and I not only attended and discussed NM success talks, but also had the opportunity to pitch potential speakers. My primary candidate for this was Robert Reed, who was kind enough to agree to speak to us all today. Robert is a well-known activist in the environmental community, but I first learned about his work in the Netflix documentary Kiss the Ground, which we watched for class last spring. Mr. Reed is the PR manager for the San Francisco-based company Recology, 
whose mission is to find sustainable ways to eliminate waste around the world. San Francisco itself was actually one of the first cities to begin composting at a citywide level, reducing the materials in landfills. The idea of one of the biggest cities in the country also becoming one of the most sustainable cities is really incredible to me. While enforcing citywide composting and waste management is difficult to execute, especially when starting from scratch, the idea itself seems extremely simple yet effective. I hope that by having Robert speak today, we can all learn more not only about Recology and their mission, but about how we can implement their hands-on approach to combating climate change here in Las Cruces as well. In addition to starring alongside Woody Harrelson in Netflix documentaries, Robert is also an accomplished writer, PR manager, and climate change activist who has done many talks like NM Success around the world in the hopes of imp implementing similar systems. Both he and Recology have a lot to offer in the fight against climate change, and I'm looking forward to learning more about Recology's mission and how we can utilize their methods here to build a cleaner society and city and hopefully a world. Thank you so much for speaking today, Robert. Hi, everybody. I um, hope you can see me and hear me, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, I've got a bunch of slides uh, that I want to go through and um, talk a lot about composting and all the benefits of, of composting. So let's get right to it. Um, paging down. Why is that not working? Stand by just a minute. There we are. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about compost today. It's, I'm very passionate about it, and um, there's tremendous benefits that come from it. And um, this is a nice picture of a high-quality compost made from food scraps and also from sticks and leaves. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about compost is it can help us grow more healthy food. Uh, there's something called the Rodell Institute, R-O-D-A-L-E. And they're the oldest uh, regenerative farming institute in the United States. And they've proven that when you farm naturally with compost, you can grow 30% more food in times of drought compared to using chemical fertilizers. So um, all this, all these nutritional, this produce comes back to our tables and we can grow 30% more if we're farming with compost. This is some compost being delivered here to a farm here in Northern California. And here it's being applied onto another farm in Northern California. Anyway, the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that when you, can, when you apply this beautiful, dark, nutrient-rich compost to farms, it makes the soil softer. It literally switches on the life web in, in the 14 inches of topsoil that grows our food. When the soil is softer, the soil retains more water from either rainfall or irrigation. So farmers want this compost for two reasons. One is it helps them grow more healthy food and the other, it helps them save water, tremendous amounts of water. Um, here you can see, this is a vineyard and the compost, this compost this farmer is holding had been applied there three days before this picture was taken. So uh, high quality compost is a natural sponge that attracts and retains water. And it is the humus and the organic matter in compost that actually uh, uh, withhold that, that, that hold that water. Here's a nice tight shot and you can really get a close look at it. You're gonna see a lot of pictures in the next 20 minutes, okay? Because I've been taking pictures to help show people how this all works. Um, this is an orchard here where the farmer used the compost to grow a cover crop between the rows of almond trees. Um, and the, that cover crop um, pulls carbon uh, and nitrogen out of the atmosphere and pushes it deep into the soil where it belongs. Also, the compost helps those trees thrive. And that, again, pulls carbon from the atmosphere and gives it back into the soil where it belongs. Um, this is another farm here that is used the compost every year for 13 years, and it's it's you know a very arid place, but it's now a, a savanna that is actually is shading the soil and um, 
you know, helping get carbon into the soil through the plants as the plants thrive, as the grasses thrive and cover the soil. Um, and the roots of those plants, the roots of those plants are entirely carbon. They're, 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 they push, those root systems push deep into the soil, six feet deep. And if I could show you a picture of the root system, it would be the size of your body. Um, here's a vineyard in um, Oakville, California, where they grow some wonderful wines. And this picture was taken a year ago, last February. Um, that's mustard growing between the rows of vines. And it, the mustard is a cover crop that pulls carbon out of the atmosphere uh, through photosynthesis and then grows a tremendous root system and pushes that carbon deep into the soil. And again, here's another, believe it or not, that's a vineyard um, that you can, I, I just wanted you to see that picture so you can see the density of the cover crop that we can grow when we use compost. So here's a you know, beautiful picture of the finished compost delivered to a vineyard. And so this is really what we're trying to accomplish. 60 days, it takes 60 days to make the compost. So you go back two or three, four months and this was eggshells and banana peels and coffee grounds and lettuce leaves and sticks and leaves. You know, And in a lot of places, those things go into landfills or go into incinerators. Um, they're a very important type of, of our discards. They're, in my mind, they're the most important type, the sticks and the leaves, because that's where the nutrients are and that's where the carbon is. So this has been all very pretty so far. Now it's gonna get, you know, uh, um, it's not gonna be so pretty for the next half, half a dozen slides. I'm gonna show you, they say that, I, I've never made sausage, but they say making sausage is not a pretty process. So making compost can be, not necessarily a pretty process either, but here we go. Um, here's a statistic from the Washington Post saying that globally we produce more than 3.5 3 million tons of trash a day. And if you put that into uh, garbage trucks, you could line them up bumper to bumper from Florida to Seattle every day. Um, so here it is, we, in, in, in often cases, we're sending this to landfills and we're, we're dumping it in on the, on the land, we're covering it with dirt, we dump more of it on the land. Um, it's really not a pretty picture. A um, lot of large, about 2000 large re regional landfills in this country. Well, what if you study that material that's going into the landfills? If you, if you had engineers who did a waste characterization study, you would find out that 34% of the garbage going into landfills in this country is material that could be composted. You know, and some of it is paper and some of it is plastic, but the largest component, our greatest opportunity to reduce landfilling is to implement curbside collection programs for composting. So we don't have to send those things, you know, the food scraps to landfills. What we've done in San Francisco, and we pioneered this in North America, we gave everybody a kitchen pail and in go their food scraps. You can see the eggshells and the ends of carrots and some uh, orange peels there. Here's another example of a kitchen pail, food scraps going in there, some pumpkin seeds, um, you know, to uh, little pieces of toast that people don't eat, other types of the cuttings, the trimmings from the preparation of meals. Um, and then we give everybody a green bin so they, they can then empty their food scraps into a bin. Rather than a garbage can, you put them in a compost bin together with your sticks and leaves. And we then collect that material in a neighborhood collection truck and we bring it to a transfer station that we built just for compostable materials. And you can see those compostable materials there on the tipping floor. And then we load them into transfer trailers, very large 18 wheel vehicles that carry 25 tons and they uh, go up on a tipper and they unload it and they drop it on the ground at a compost facility. We operate eight large outdoor composting facilities on the West Coast. Now let's take a closer look at that material that's fallen on the ground. So remember I told you it's not so pretty now. 
This is the compostable material when it arrives at the compost facility. And if you look at it, I encourage you to look at it with a garbage man's eyes. A garbage man doesn't see garbage. A garbage man sees cardboard or paper or yard trimmings like sticks and leaves or metal. Um, but this is very heavy. You get the sense that it's very heavy. It's very dense. Now there's some plastic bags there. Some people have made mistakes and we're gonna correct those mistakes. And there's some compostable liner bags there. But you can see the density of it, it's heavy. And that tells you there's a lot of food scraps there. And then we pick it up with a crane and we load it into a sorting system. So we, it's, a, it's, it's a system where we have to, as soon as it arrives, we have to remove anything that's not, that it's not supposed to be there, anything that um, will not compost, such as a plastic bag or a tennis shoe. Part of that sorting system is a manual sort line um, where we remove plastic bags. We also do a lot of outreach and education on the front end so that people are putting the correct things in, that, in those green bins and San Franciscans do a really good job of getting it right. And then we start the composting process and there's, there's 11 steps to the process. I don't have time to show you all the steps, but here's one of the early steps. It's called an aerated static pile. And um, the material is, is um, we're drawing, we're, we're pushing air through it. And so we're creating the conditions so that the microorganisms that are in the compost can do their job. The microbial colonies can break that material down into smaller and smaller pieces. So they need air and they need water, just like you do and I do. So we push air into the zones through the floor of the compost facility. And when necessary, then we uh, irrigate and we apply some water to the top of it. This is a little further in the process. And you can see the material is starting to break down. Um, you can see some plastic bags that are still in the, the material, but um, they're lightweight and, and um, we are gonna screen them out. And I want you to look at that pile and again, get a sense of the density of it. Most of that material there is compostable material. Most of it is heavy. And then here's the trommel screen. So this is a screen in the middle of those 11 steps and we, we screen it. And this, when, when you remove the things that are, are didn't compost, or maybe they're the size of my fingers, they haven't broken down enough yet. But this is the unders. This is the uh, smaller particles that go through the screen. And then we organize it in long windrows like this one. This machine is called a windrow turner. So every day we straddle, or every other day we straddle those rows and we turn them. Again, we're just creating the conditions so the microorganisms can do their job. This would happen naturally if you just threw banana peels and such out on, on the ground somewhere, but we're helping it move along faster. And then we screen it again. So this is near the end of the process and that's an immature compost coming off the finished screen there at the end. And that's starting to look pretty good. This is uh, our compost facility, a um, little bit north of Los Angeles. They're uh, receiving about a thousand tons of material per day uh, as feedstock, and they're making a beautiful uh, compost. So this is the compost coming off of their finished screen. There's a tighter shot so you can get a sense of that material. Very small particles. And that's what farmers want. They want it to be very small. So it's available to the microorganisms on, in their topsoils. Again, the I, farmers would look at this picture and they would look at the dust on my fingers. They want to see very small particles. And this is what you get when you, when you have an advanced composting system. Then we also have amendments on our, at our compost facility. We have gypsum and lime and sandy loam and minerals. And so we can blend the compost together with other amendments and we can make custom blends that match what different farms need to help them get their soils in balance. Here we are making a blend. You'll see it's a little bit red in the bucket up there. Um, that's because that's redwood sawdust uh, that we're blending into the compost. And here it is delivered to a vineyard. 
um, it's steaming because it's still composting, it's still active. And then you can also see some mustard in the background there that the vineyard manager is growing. Um, Lots of vineyards have used this compost, hundreds of them, lots of orchards. Um, this gentleman, like a lot of farmers, used to use chemicals, but now is completely flipped and is using compost and understands that that's very healthy and, and a better way to go for their soil and helps them save water. Here's some compost delivered to an orchard. It's a 1600 acre orchard near Sacramento. Those are vines on the right and olive trees on the left. This is another farm, a smaller farm, where they um, hand apply the compost around their trees. Um, but they've been using it for um, um, 13 years, every year. This is a vineyard. And this, this, in this vineyard, and a lot of vineyards, they put the compost right over the roots of the vines, um, which helps hold moisture in the root zone. So this is how farms in, in California can survive 100, state, 100 straight days of 100 degree temperatures. The, the compost holds moisture in the soil, makes the soil softer. Um, and then uh, they're able to grow wonderful wine grapes, some very beautiful, healthy plants with supple vines. Um, this was from another vineyard that's been using our compost. This is, picture was taken in September during the harvest. Um, when these grapes go into the winery, they are rated and they're rated ultra premium. These are, you can grow really high quality produce if you make your soil healthy. Again, another picture from that same uh, vineyard there um, in Northern California. And here's the vineyard owner actually helping with the harvest. You can, I encourage you to look at his vines. Look at those big leaves on his vines. They're like solar panels. You can't do that, guys, with chemicals. You can only do that if your soil is healthy and your soil is soft and you're, you're farming naturally with compost. Here they are, they, they pick the grapes and they're going off to the winery. Um, and the wines, by the way, uh, these particular wines uh, won um, an award for um, best uh, Zinfandel uh, in the San Francisco uh, Chronicle Wine Competition. So not only are we helping farms grow more food, we're actually helping them win awards. We're helping them grow better tasting food. Uh, this is my friend, Nigel Walker. Uh, he grows ver tomatoes and um, those are heirloom tomatoes. And I encourage you to look at his vines. His vines are so big and so healthy, he had to put in those giant wooden stakes just to hold them up. Um, Nigel, like these other farms, he's used our compost every year for 10 consecutive years. And uh, other farmers are using it to grow, of course, potatoes and peppers, like in your part of the world. These are squashes. Um, uh, these are table grapes. And I really encourage you to take a look at this picture. This is a very hot part of California. It doesn't rain for six months. Um, this is one vine. I mean, it's just weighted down tremendously with these plump table grapes. How, how is this possible? Well, the compost makes the soil soft. And then when it rains, that water, because the soil is soft, that water is able to go five feet deep. It's very efficient. It trans, the water transfers five or six feet deep into the soil. And then at night, when the moon passes over the land, the gravity of the moon then pulls that water up and gives the roots a drink and cools the roots at night, just like the way the moon raises the tide uh, in the ocean. So there's a lot happening here that really ties into nature. These are persimmons uh, grown on a farm using our, that's one branch. One, and it's just showing you that, that the lushness, the volume here, the health. Uh, again, look at the leaves of the plant. You, you can't do this with chemicals. These are uh, cauliflower. Um, it's called Romanesco, the um, bright green one there, uh, all grown with our compost. The farmers in Northern California absolutely love it. These are some lettuces from my backyard here in San Francisco and in some herbs. And you can see uh, how soft the soil is, how dark the soil is. 
um, just the fog in San Francisco um, um, provides enough moisture for the, these plants. Um, you've seen these pictures already. These are this 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 um, broadcaster here is how the farmers go down the rows of vines on, on vineyards and apply the compost right along the root line. Um, again, this is um, an orchard uh, where they use the compost to grow cover crops. And you get a little higher view here, and I encourage you to look right along under the trees and you can see the mound of compost right underneath the trees. And it's so rich, it actually helps with weed control. It, 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 um, it's too rich for the weeds. And so that's good for the trees as well. So they don't have weeds competing with their roots. Um, here's another picture of cover crops grown with the compost, keeping the land covered, growing those roots, pushing carbon into the soil. And you can see the different flowers there. Um, and again, the mustard, and this is of course is very good for bees. We all know that bees have been struggling. Without bees, we would lose one third of the foods we eat. And so composting also helps insects like bees. Now here's some headlines. Um, a wonderful news agency called the Good News Network did a story uh, about a year ago reporting that about 200 cities have followed San Francisco's lead and implemented curbside food scrap collection for composting. Um, this shows our three bin system in San Francisco, blue for recycling, green for composting, the gray bin there for anything that you can't recycle or compost. Um, it's a program that is being modeled uh, in a lot of cities in California. There's 400 cities here, and um, there's a, we, the state has passed a law. This program has inspired a law so that cities all up and down the state are, are doing this program. Um, here's another article that uh, I encourage you to read. It's probably the best article I could uh, suggest uh, how San Francisco, uh, Crack the Urban Composting Code. It's a long feature article and really uh, provides details and inside baseball about how we did it and, and how we got everybody in San Francisco to embrace and participate in curbside composting. Um, I shared this uh, article with some of the organizers here for the event. So I think they're gonna provide ways for everybody to find it, but uh, you can also just Google it. Um, one of the tricks of the trade um, is teaching students about recycling. You know, uh, people have studied different ways to get adults to recycle. And it uh, turns out one of the most effective ways is to teach kids about recycling and composting. And then the kids go home and teach their parents. So, and then the kids, uh, of course, they, be, they carry that through their teens and, and into their adult years, they become recyclers and composters too. So um, you kind of getting a double bang for your buck there by putting a lot of your education and a lot of your outreach towards students. Um, let's move on here. Uh, the San Francisco Chronicle did a piece a year ago um, about this law that uh, this program is inspired. So um, cities up and down the state need to reduce the amount of compostable materials they're sending to landfills. And um, people need hope. And this program provides a lot of hope. Um, here's a video that was done, a video news report uh, in July about how applying compost helps farms uh, survive drought and dry periods. And um, we can't make enough compost for the farms in California. They, they want every bit we can make because they, they, through experience, they have learned that it helps them save water. It holds water in the soil. And, and when they don't have to irrigate as often, it also saves them money because they don't have to run their pump. So they, they, their utility bill is smaller as well. Um, this article was published last week. Um, uh, New York City, the largest city in this country, 8.5 million inhabitants, 
is uh, now uh, implementing curbside composting citywide in New York City. That's a pretty big deal, guys. And uh, Los Angeles, uh, uh, second largest city in this country, 4.5 million people is also rolling out curbside composting collection for food scraps and for yard trimmings. Uh, so Los Angeles is going to be producing uh, on the order of 4,000 tons a day of material for composting. So um, it's really, you know, this is something we started 26 years ago, 27 years ago in San Francisco. And uh, other executives and other uh, uh, garbage companies were quoted in the trade press uh, 26 years ago saying it had never been tried, it would never work, the trucks were going to leave. Well, you know, together with the city and our customers, we did make it work. And we built a market for the compost. And now cities are across, you know, more than 200 cities and, and lots of universities are, are following this and doing this. It's literally, guys, we've toured delegations from 135 countries. Um, and they're, now they're COVID, they're, they're, you know, they're getting past COVID and they're going to come back. And uh, we've helped start this program in Paris, France, and in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and lots of other places. Uh, we participated in conferences in Canada. Um, in, in my mind, we're really changing the way the world does garbage. This program ought to be replicated uh, um, in large cities all around the planet. Um, it's good for farming. It's good for everybody. Um, so um, with that, um, I'm going to stop talking and leave, it leaves us quite a bit of time for questions and answers. And hopefully this will be very interactive. Great, thank you so much, Robert. Um, that's fabulous and, and really exciting. We. Um, have some questions coming into the, the Q&A. And um, for everyone in the audience, um, please feel free to post your questions in the, in the Q&A. I've uh, dropped the San Francisco Cracked the Composting Code article in the chat. And Robert has also provided a 12 Reasons to Compost document that, that I'll drop there so audience members can, can have that with some, some information. Um, and I will, um, along with Adeline, um, facilitate some of the questions. So they're coming in, quite a, quite a number of them coming in now. So we better get to the questions. I'm going to start with the first one, um, Robert. And this is from um, Corey Lebec. So this is our, um, what are the requirements for a town that has the potential or interest in bringing recology to the community? Uh, well, Recology is an um, employee-owned company. Uh, we're headquartered, we're based, we started, and we're based in San Francisco. And we provide um, collection and recycling services, composting services to uh, about 135 cities, about 130 cities uh, on the West Coast. Um, so uh, our website is recology.com. Um, we, we, uh, you know, we we were glad to help all types of cities, small, medium, and large, um, improve their recycling programs, um, you know, improve their composting programs or implement composting programs, uh, or or uh, you know, maybe a group of cities to uh, establish a composting facility where maybe four or five cities can send their materials for composting, kind of a regional approach. Uh, we've done that here in California. And um, we're glad to help anybody who, who wants the help, you know, who wants to do this kind of thing. It needs to really come from, I mean, cities, it's, it's city councils and, and city of, you know, city leaders that hire uh, typically hire companies to to be their garbage and recycling and composting companies. So um, the the request has to come from the city officials. And I'm a former reporter. Uh, I worked at daily newspapers for 10 years. And um, so I know that, you know, uh, officials 
when, when, when enough people want to do something, then the officials will, will um, you know, feel, they'll feel that and then they'll want that to happen. So uh, it, you really got to create an appetite in the community, you know, and, and we can come and do this kind of presentation in the community. We can help create that appetite. Um, so th those are some of the ways that Recology can help, but we would, would very much like to help um, anywhere we can. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. How successful has your program been with ensuring the largest food waste creators contribute? Restaurants, stores, et cetera. You know, in, in San Francisco, uh, we've had great success with restaurants. Uh, when we started the program, it was voluntary. And uh, the San Francisco Restaurant Association immediately embraced the program. Uh, amazingly, we've got 5,000 restaurants in San Francisco. And uh, the, the higher end restaurants uh, were right on board. They were really into it. Um, we have a big food and wine community here. So this was a natural fit for them. Um, and then after we were rolling for five or six years, then the uh, city made the program mandatory. So then all the restaurants and all the apartments and the skyscrapers and everybody else had to do it. So uh, we've had great success with that. And it's a great question um, of the material that can be composted in a, in, in a city. Um, usually about 50% of it comes from the commercial sector and 50% comes from the residential sector. But you need both. You know, we, we all need to come to the party. Great. Another question um, from Danielle Young is about how much water are farmers saving per year using this compost? That's a really good question. And the answer depends upon uh, the type of soil that they have. So uh, some farms, the soil is very hard and um, you know, when they use compost, it makes their soil softer and that can really help them save a lot of water. Other farms, uh, you know, it, 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 the answer would have to be a range because uh, you have such different um, types of soil and you know, they're really the soil is different from farm to farm. But um, I can tell you that um, there's some almond farmers uh, in California and almonds do use a lot of money, uh, use a lot of water, sorry. Um, um, and they've found that they can um, reduce their water usage uh, uh, by 20% in some cases. So, um, you know, it'd be a different number for of course, different soils and different farms, but um, it compost is, High quality compost is a natural sponge that attracts and retains water. And it also, when you apply compost, it switches on the life web in the soil. It feeds the microbial colonies in your soil. That makes the soil softer. That allows, it makes the soil more water efficient. It allows water when it rains to, to efficiently move and penetrate deep into the soil. And so, like I showed you that picture of Nigel Walker, the, the uh, fellow who had the tomatoes, who grows the tomatoes. Um, when it rains, and when it rains hard, there, the water does not run off his farm. Um, um, when I have other, the, I showed you some other pictures of another farmer there, that 1600 acre uh, orchard, which is the picture uh, you're looking at now, which is the title and ending picture on this um, presentation. And it rained like heck recently here, and there were no puddles on this farm because the water is going right into the soil. So the next question is from Sue Reba, who asked, what are the hurdles to implement this in a city like Las Cruces? Well, I, I don't know the local, um, um, factors, uh, but in, in a, small or medium sized city or even a larger city, you, you need to have a place to take the material that you're collecting for composting. So you need to have a, a uh, outdoor um, 
regional composting facility and I use re regional because I recommend you know building one that that four or five cities can send their material to um, something on the order of 50 or 100 acres. Um, and uh, really, it, it, you have to have an appetite to want to do it. Um, and um, it's, it, I think it's, we should all have that appetite. I mean, be, this is the, the upside here is remarkable. Um, let me answer the question this way. There are four main reasons to recycle your bottles, cans, and paper. It keeps material, recycling keeps materials out of landfills. It um, saves trees, it creates green jobs, and it supports the supply chain. Those are, the, in my mind, those are the four big reasons to recycle. I can give you 14, 18, 20 reasons off the top of my head to compost. Um, that's why I wrote the 12 reasons to compost, which is being used in a lot of areas. That's why we've been talking about, you know, uh, that, that this program can grow more food, can save water, can sequester carbon. The benefits are numerous. So the benefits are significant. Uh, that's why I say that the food scraps and the six and leaves are the most important type of garbage that exists. This is where the carbon is. This is where the nutrients are. There's so much good that can come out of this. And so we just need to create a buzz about it. We need to talk about it. We need to help people better understand all these benefits. When everybody understands that, when everybody gets it, when the light bulb goes on, a lot of people are going to want to do it. And that's happening in cities all across this country. And they're celebrating in New York a uh, headline today saying um, that this is a big win for locals in New York. So the more people know about it, the more people want it, the more it's gonna happen. Next question. So this is a question uh, about cover crops actually. Um, if, if you could uh, think about when choosing a cover crop, do you have any recommendations in particular for an area such as New Mexico? You've shown all of these great pictures of, of cover crops. Um, well, I think you're, you're um, local uh, ag community will know based on their historical experiences, which cover crops um, uh, have been grown traditionally in your region. Um, there are, it's easy to do uh, an internet search and learn about, you know, a great variety of cover crops. Uh, Common vetch is one of them. Uh, brass button is another one. Um, uh, uh, mustard, you know, is, is another. Um, um, sometimes it's it's beans, and you know, we don't grow these crops to harvest them. We we grow them to uh, make the soil more healthy and to to feed the microbial colonies in the soil. When the cover crops die, the the roots. Uh, uh, of the cover crops become food for the microbial colonies in the soil. But uh, to be direct, um, there, there are lots of different ones and it's nice to grow a mixture of cover crops. Uh, it's well known that different plants can help each other. So um, I would look to your local uh, ag community and, and people have been farming for a long time. Uh, I'm sure people are doing it and, and have have had uh, experiences with specific uh, uh, cover crops. Next question. Treadwell Atkins asked, how do you deal with problems such as meat and grease? I've always been told they are a no-no. Well, um, when we're talking about meat, we're talking mostly about uh, meat that's been cooked, uh, like a steak bone, um, or maybe some lunch meat that, um, uh, we had in the refrigerator and we forgot to eat it and now it's it's too old to eat um and then um you know there's cooking oils and such um and these things they're very difficult to compost in a in a backyard composting situation because you um because you don't achieve uh, particularly high temperatures in a backyard composting situation 
but uh, at, at, at a commercial scale, like the pictures I showed you and the, the, the eight composting facilities that we operate, uh, we, our compost uh, piles or, or windrows achieve 135 degrees Fahrenheit within three days. So it's tremendous microbial activity. And um, they, the, the, those microbes will uh, break down steak bones and pieces of cooked meat and um, uh, salad dressing and, and things like this. Um, so we want all your uh, food scraps uh, in, in this type of uh, municipal commercial uh, composting program. Uh, the, the, the program done correctly uh, can handle that material very well. Next question. Great. Um, there are a few questions that I think follows up on, on that question well that um, bring up issues of uh, odor, right? Um, is odor an issue? How do you deal with this? Um, we, oh, a, a few questions asked about, you know, insects, rodents, you know, are those an issue in urban areas and how are they um, handled? Um, do homeowner bins for compost pick up, develop odor? And um, are you located remotely so as not to defend your neighbors if there is that odor? So there, I'm, I'm, I'm building together a few questions that asked about odor to have you addressed the smell? Yeah. You know, when we started in San Francisco, we got this question a lot. And when I do presentation in other cities, this question comes up a lot. Um, it's actually a, a false phobia. Um, when you get a kitchen pail, um, one of the tricks uh, is that you put a used paper towel at the bottom of the kitchen pail. And then in go your coffee grounds, your eggshells, your banana peels and such. That used paper napkin or paper towel will absorb moisture and help control odor. And then before you go to bed, once a day, you, you carry the kitchen pail out and you, you dump it in your green curbside composting bin. Um, and when you do this, there's actually less odor in your kitchen. No longer are you mixing together things that might smell with other garbage in a garbage can under the kitchen sink. There's nothing, there's nothing in your kitchen at night while you're sleeping to smell. There, so you have less odor in your kitchen. Um, also, um, at the compost facilities, um, we, we, um, we deliver the material there early in the morning, uh, four in the morning and five in the morning in these outdoor facilities. And they're out in the country, uh, typically uh, in, in, the, in the agricultural sector near the farms, because that's where the compost is gonna go anyway. So um, we, we, as soon as we receive the material, like I showed in the presentation, we, we pick it up with a crane, we load it into our pre-sort system, we sort it and we get it into the uh, zones um, and the windrows very quickly. So, um, and you know, it's good that it's, when we receive the material and when, when, when we're composting the material, or chopping it up and such. It's a combination of food scraps together with sticks and leaves. Now, to be honest, if we were all at the composting facility right now, it would smell a little farmy. Yeah, it, but it, 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 it's not a terrible smell. It's, it's, not, a, a, it's not a bad odor. Uh, we don't have a lot of odor complaints um, because we're running a professional operation and there's 11 steps to our composting process. Um, and a lot of people uh, tell us when they come for tours that they're surprised that it doesn't smell as bad as they thought it would. And in fact, the finished compost um, uh, smells quite good. It smells a little bit like a um, like you're uh, out in nature. Uh, it, it, it is a soil amendment. I mean, and we, I think we any of us can go to uh, a landscape supply yard and, and smell for ourselves. So. Um, odor is much less of an issue than you might think. Next question. Caitlin Mary asked, what are the first steps that community members can take to get curbside composting implemented? Well, I think the first steps are uh, in some communities, for example, people write uh, opinion editorial pieces or uh, opinion columns and get them uh, published in the local newspaper. Um, you can organize 
a community meeting. Um, in, you mentioned the, uh, Adeline, you mentioned the film Kiss the Ground. Um, there's a scene in that film where uh, residents organized the meeting uh, at a um, neighborhood coffee shop uh, community meeting. And they thought just a handful of people are going to show up. Well, 60 people came. Um, you know, we can, this very presentation and you, we participated in together here tonight. We can have that happening at a community meeting. It's like any other thing. You got to you got to get the good people around the kitchen table. You got to talk about it, and you got and you got to um, um, share information. This is a knowledge exchange. So the more people know all this good stuff, the more it'll move forward. Next question. Great, thank you. I'm going to group a few questions um, together again. We have a number of questions still coming in, and we're going to get through as many of them as we can in the time that we have. Um, but uh, one question is about um, how Recology deals with contamination. And perhaps related to that, um, there's another question that's also um, that Katie Getz asks um, related to the meat question. Um, does Recology assess finished, assess finished compost for pesticides residue or the presence of noxi noxious weed seeds? Okay, so those are those are two questions, and the first one on contamination. Um, uh, I'll answer it this way: um, a clever person solves a problem; a wise person avoids it all together. So, uh, what I'm getting at here is we got to keep plastic and we got to keep glass out of that green bin, and uh, if we can do that, then we've avoided the problem altogether of contamination. And so we need to do a lot of outreach and we need to do a lot of education. There's no such thing as treading water in business. So we must continually do outreach, continually do education, you know, and show people, you know, part of the education is showing people the beautiful food, the healthy food that the farmers are able to grow when this program goes well. And then that food comes back to our tables. But one of the things we do in San Francisco is we put uh, oranges in paper bags and then we walk, went around and we knocked on people's door and we, gave, we, we, we asked them to compost. And we told them that if they did, you know, we handed them this paper bag and they loved it. They loved the weight of the orange or the pear that was in the paper bag. And we told them if they, you know, if they composted, then there'd be more oranges and more pears next year. We could come back and bring them, bring them two oranges and two pears. You know, we, it's, it's very hands-on and on the front end. And we also um, have pictures on the bins, on the lids of the bins to show people what goes inside. So no matter what language you speak, you can see what goes in what bin. Um, and we, you know, we 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 really do a lot of communication about this. I think we've got you know a fantastic customer newsletter. We do a lot through social media. We're doing a lot at schools. There's a lot of signage. There's a lot of uh, education, and we've done compost giveaways so so people can get some of the compost. You know, all of, there's lots of different ways to do it, but you you, you you do your very best and you go, you know, to get people to work on the front end of this. Um, and then um, at restaurants, you know, we had to make a specific effort to help people who are cleaning up in restaurants when, when, the, when the, all the diners go home and all the employees go home and there's just people then cleaning up to make sure that they're putting the glass bottles in the blue bin, that they're recycling the glass bottles because if they go in the blue bin, they don't go into the green bin. And then we have our sorting system on the back end. And we don't talk to the public about it a lot, but we do remove plastic bags and other contaminants as soon as the material arrives at the composting facility. And then we screen it multiple times as we go through the composting process. So that's, that's my answer on contamination. On pathogens, I'm sorry, on pesticides um, and weed seed. Um, weed seed's not a problem because we achieve these temperatures of over 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, um, we have a, 
for, for many, many days in the composting process. And we do test the uh, um, compost. We have an independent laboratory test the compost every year uh, and sometimes twice a year. Um, and it tests, uh, we, 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 we don't see pesticides or very trace amounts. Uh, so the, the compost um, uh, is, is very um, high quality um, um, and, and healthy for soil. And um, so the farmers, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. The farmers uh, absolutely love it. Um, and uh, we're, they're asking us to make more and more um, and because the benefits uh, are extraordinary. They're able to grow more healthy food and they're able to save water. And they're actually, they're able to grow even, even um, cover crops that attract beneficial insects. And so in this way, you know, they can, uh, they can grow different cover crops in, in different rows side by side. And when they grow those types of cover crops, that attract beneficial insects, they, they, they don't have to use as many herbicides. So that helps on that part of the equation as well. Next question. This next one says, curious if you can or want to speak about backyard chickens and composting efficiency. Well, I think backyard uh, composting, we, you know, there are no silver bullets. And so we need to do all of these things. We need backyard composting. That takes transportation out of the equation. And I love chickens and I eat eggs. Uh, and so and I imagine most of us do. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I, we also need uh, large scale composting programs because not everybody can, has a place to do backyard composting or the time to do it. Um, in restaurants, which we were asked about earlier, they generate very large amounts of, of food scraps um, that need to be composted and they don't have uh, places to take them. Um, and then of course we have things like universities, like your university. I mean, they might have 30,000 people living in a relatively working and studying in a relatively small area, consuming you know, a lot of meals, a lot of food, meals prepared, a lot of food scraps, they need to go somewhere. And so it's important to have uh, um, a, a community uh, a curbside composting programs. We, we ought, you know, we got to get this stuff out of our garbage cans. And where we do have, you know, uh, um, curbside programs for trash. And so we're able to reduce the size of our garbage cans uh, by giving people instead a curbside composting bin. Next question. So we have a couple questions um, about the, um, the, the market side of it. So one being from, from um, Mary Streeter, do you have to have a market for the compost fertilizers before you get started? And economically, how is this process funded? And then perhaps a related question, um, uh, from Hope Garden, um, what does a truckload of compost cost to the consumer farmer and yearly what profit can a city make from selling compost? Um, so if you could speak about the marketing and economics side of it. Okay, so I made notes. I'm gonna speak to those three issues. And I see that we've, you know, we're, we're getting close to the end here. So we built a market for the compost. We provided way back in, uh, 2000 and 2001, we would provide um, loads to the vineyards. Uh, we would complementary loads to the vineyards so they could try it. Um, and they um, had very good results. And, um, and so uh, there's something about farmers, uh, farmers talk. And so uh, because farmers are having good results, they, they told other farmers, other farmers tried it and um, they had really good results, um, particularly in the third year. Uh, if you apply compost for three consecutive years, your, your garden will do quite well. So um, we built a market for the compost and, and, and now the market is so strong, we can't make enough compost to satisfy the market. 
Um, how is the program funded? Well, you don't sell dirt for a lot of money. So um, it helps, you know, there's some money that comes back uh, to from the sale of the compost to help pay for the operation of the compost facility. Um, but it's not, this is not um, a, a, a huge revenue generator. So, um, you know, if recycling and if composting were huge revenue generators, we wouldn't have landfills. But um, there, is, there are costs to collecting uh, 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 our discards. We have to have trucks, we have to have fuel in those trucks, we have to have insurance, we have to pay the employees a good wage. It's a, it's a tough and dirty job collecting garbage. Um, and, and that's why people get a, a, a garbage bill. Uh, in San Francisco, a typical house pays uh, about $45 a month for garbage service. Um, the, the, it's, it's higher in Oakland, it's higher in San Jose. Um, now the sale of the paper and the bottles and cans is factored into that. It helps offset some of the costs. Uh, we also have to operate a recycling facility we have a lot of equipment there and the sale of the materials helps offset some of those costs. The same is true for the compost. The sale of the compost helps offset some of the costs of operating the composting facility, but this is funded through um, the monthly fees that people and businesses pay for their uh, refuse collection services for the most part. Um, and the question, the last question you asked was, can cities profit from this? Um, this is not a profit center for cities. Um, uh, this is a service and it is, and so there's a cost to providing that service. It's collection, it's sorting, it's composting. Um, and this is, it really makes sense in the long term because if you send it to a landfill, there is no money coming back. In fact, uh, once it goes in a landfill, it never comes out. And then the landfill fills up and you got to build another landfill. You got to buy more land. You got to buy build another landfill further away. You have more transportation costs. So the, the recycling and composting model uh, is actually a better overall model if you look at, at, at this. And, and if we're going to talk about things like funding and costs and revenues. And if we're gonna be responsible, we gotta talk about all the costs and all the revenues. And when you do that, we absolutely have to do this. We have to recycle and we have to compost. We cannot afford to just put everything in a landfill. Uh, recycling one ton of paper saves 17 trees. Most of the material in your recycling bin is, is by weight, is some form of fiber. It's either paper or cardboard. And so when we recycle it, that supports the supply chain. That helps us make more cardboard boxes. And, and we need cardboard boxes for all the commerce that happens in this country. Um, and also we haven't talked about landfills are one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions in this country, including methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. So when we compost instead, we reduce, we keep uh, uh, compostable materials out of landfills, we reduce landfill gas emissions, um, and we help uh, farms grow cover crops and, and other plants that pull carbon from the atmosphere and get it back into the soil. And we need to do that too that has both environmental benefits and economic benefits. Well, we've nearly made it through all of the great questions that were in the q and I think we're gonna have um, one more question from the Q&A and then wrap up. And before Adeline asks those questions, I just also wanna say that the documents that we dropped into the chat have more information and I'm assuming you're okay being contacted, Robert, since your contact information is in the document. So, um, so if, if you wanna reach out to, more to Robert, you have that, um, but I'm gonna hand it back over to Adeline for um, one last question from the chat. 
So the last question is from Dan Townsend, who asks, can the waste you reference be mixed with compost from wastewater treatment facilities? Um, we are not permitted to compost uh, fecal matter. Uh, we compost food scraps and yard trimmings, which are sticks and leaves. Um, so, uh, the um, sewage sludge from sewer treatment plants um, can contain um, 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 uh, medicines and um, uh, I've forgotten the word right here at the moment, but when, when people get um, shots and, and different um, um, inoculations and so on and so forth. Some of those can pass through the body and wind up in the stool and they can wind up in the um, solids from sewer treatment plants. And we don't want those, those elements getting into compost um, and, and potentially being picked up by the roots of the plants. Um, so we, we, we don't put that, we don't, uh, um, include uh, uh, sewer sludge in the compost um, for those reasons. Well, thank you so much for taking the time with us this evening, Robert. Um, thank you, Adeline, um, for the, the Q&A and the introduction. And thank you all in the audience for, for joining us. Um, uh, a virtual round of uh, applause for, for Robert Reed. And again, our, our next talk in the NM Success Series is February 28th at Felton Theater with Diana Liverman. And in the chat, um, you will have seen a flyer for that, as well as um, two documents related to the inspiring um, information on, on compost that Robert shared with us this evening. I hope you all have a, a great evening and um, thank you and take care. Okay, thank you guys. Good luck out there. If I can help, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs>